Professor Fred Ruberg is the newly appointed chair of cardiology at the Boston University Medical Center, which is one of the largest amyloid centers in, in the world. And he'll be talking about how we actually image the heart and TTR amyloidosis to monitor. Professor Ruberg. I guess the joke was cut, Dr. Gertz, in terms of time, so we have to move on. I, I'm really glad I have slides, because I'm supposed to be talking about imaging, and I pulled them up on my phone here. Just, you can all see that, right? Uh, John Wall and I were joking that I would have to make shadow puppets to make this actual talk work. Let's see if the slide advance works. It is uh, this one, right? Okay. Oh, I got it. Okay, I pushed the wrong button. Okay, so I'm Rick Ruberg from Boston University, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I, I am an imaging cardiologist. I see patients in clinic. I've seen many of you in clinic, but I also spend time interpreting these imaging tests that I'm going to talk about that most of you have had. Um, when my kids ask me what that means functionally, it, it basically just means that I sit in a dark room, drink coffee, and watch TV all day, and they say, that's a pretty good job. So. Um, so we're going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about the imaging testing. So Dr. Grogan has done an amazing job, as she always does, kind of setting the table for what amyloid does to the heart. And those Mayo illustrations are just absolutely beautiful, and I recommend you to, to look at them um, because they really drive the point home. We already learned that amyloid deposits in between heart muscle cells. It causes the heart to become thicker, it causes the heart to become stiffer, and it injures the heart muscle cells directly, and that's why you have troponin elevation. And Dr. Grogan has also beautifully illustrated how the heart works. I'm not going to go into any more detail there, except just to introduce two terms. The squeezing function of the heart is called systole. The relaxing function of the heart is called diastole. You are now all doctors. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so when you look at a picture of the heart, and you can see that cartoon on the left, what amyloid does is it causes the heart muscle to become thicker. You all know this. But high blood pressure also causes the heart muscle to become thicker. So does aortic stenosis, anything that increases the pressure in the heart. And if you just look at the, pick up the heart in terms of its thickness, you can't tell the difference whether it's amyloid, as you can see in that middle slide, or the true hypertrophy, which is what happens with high blood pressure. And using imaging, we can tease this apart and try to figure out, is that thickening that we see due to high blood pressure, which is really common, aortic stenosis, which is also pretty common, or amyloid, which is maybe a little less common. So we use echocardiography to measure the wall thickness. We'll talk about that. We use cardiac MRI to measure the space in between the cells where the amyloid deposits. We'll talk about that. And we use nuclear imaging to actually identify the amyloid or what the amyloid basically binds to in the heart. And I'll talk a little bit about that, and Dr. Wall will talk about the rest. So these are two echocardiograms, I'm grateful the movies play, showing a normal heart on the left and a cardiac amyloidosis heart on the right. So this is cardiac ultrasound, the same kind of ultrasound that you may have had if you um, are a mother when you had a baby. So the ultrasound beams go on, they bounce into the body and they bounce off and they show the heart and we can create a moving picture. And I think you don't need to be a doctor to appreciate that the heart on the left is thicker than the heart on the right. We don't know whether that thickness is due to amyloidosis. In this case, it is, but the echo doesn't tell us that in particular. The other thing you can appreciate here is the squeezing of the heart. And I'll tell you that both of these hearts are squeezing normally. And so this is that point that Dr. Maher made, that you could have a totally normal or even a, a, a nor ejection fraction that's in the upper range of normal, but still have pretty significant impairment. And we'll talk about that in a few seconds. So echo is really useful because it uses ultrasound. There's no risk, there's no side effects. It's really perfectly safe. You cannot hurt anybody with ultrasound. It's tremendously portable. We perform it at the bedside, and the technology actually is even now compatible with your smartphone or tablet. You can go and buy an echo transducer probe for about two or $3,000 that you can plug into your phone, and many doctors do that, and they actually go around in the hospital and they, they, they ultrasound people. It's pretty inexpensive, actually, um, and it's widely available. I don't know any place in the United States where you can't get ultrasound. Now, if you're in a resource-poor setting in the rest of the world, that's different, but here in the U.S., it's everywhere. It's also not that hard to interpret. 
I mean, obviously I'm maybe kind of dumbing it down a little bit, but the training for ultrasound of the heart, cardiac echo, is in the context of any normal cardiac uh, fellowship or training program. So most cardiologists will be familiar with this and can, and many of them, um, through the context of normal training without anything advanced, can interpret ultrasound. It's also becoming a lot more automated. You all know about artificial intelligence. This is one of the places where artificial intelligence is being applied, using letting the machine determine what's normal, what are the measurements and everything. Now the problem with echo is that it occasionally gives you poor image quality. So sometimes the pictures don't look so good. This is different than the blood test Dr. Grogan talked about. Almost every time you draw a blood, uh, you blood sample, you can make the measurement that you want. Not every time, but almost every time. But with echo, it's, it's kind of hit or miss. Most of the time the images look good, but sometimes they don't. So echo provides information on structure, thickening, the systolic squeezing function, the contractile function, the diastolic function or relaxation, valve function, we're not gonna talk a lot about that today, and pressures, that's really important. Echo is the only imaging modality that really tells you what the pressures are in the heart. And pressure is what translates into symptoms. So what, you, what do you get in your echo reports? So every echo report is gonna comment on um, three of these, and most of them should comment on the last one. So every echo is gonna tell you what the wall thickness is, and we measure two places in the heart I'm gonna show you, the interventricular septum between the two ventricles and the posterior wall. Every echo is gonna comment on systolic function. What's the squeezing function? And as Dr. Maher showed you, that's a measure of the global volume change of the heart. Every echo is gonna comment on diastolic function, although as I'll show you, sometimes diastolic function we can't really tell. And in amyloid, we are now using this new measurement called systolic strain, which is a way to more sensitively look at the squeezing function of the heart. So this is a picture of a heart on the left that's moving, and then I've frozen it on the right to show you how we measure wall thickness. We literally draw a lot, two dots and, connect, and a line between the, in those walls. And you can see, if you just move those dots just a little bit, you can really change the measurement. And so this is um, not really that precise. I mean, a human, me, is going in and measuring these walls. And if I just move those dots just a little bit, I can change the measurement by two, three, four millimeters, and that can be a significant difference. So wall thickness is universally available to be measured in almost every echo, but it's not the most, there's a fair amount of variation. And so you really shouldn't get hung up on changes in wall thickness, especially if they're pretty small. And I put the normal ranges in there. A woman should have less than 10, 10 millimeters or one centimeter, and a man is 11. But these are really precise measures that, that have a fair amount of variation. Dr. Maurer already showed you about ejection fraction. This is the way in which we do it in the echo lab. We draw actual a contour, a line around the inside of the heart in systole and diastole. And I'll tell you, you just move that line just a little bit, you can make big changes in this number as well. So it's not also that precise. There is some precision to it, obviously, within about 5%. And we measure it different ways. Sometimes we can't even draw these contours and we just use our eyeballs and through seeing thousands of these, we say, oh, it's 50, it's 60. Again, there's a fair amount of variation there in subjectivity. Diastolic function is even harder. We grade it one, two, three, or normal. But doctors have to interpret five different measurements to figure out di diastolic function. And I have the algorithm on the right where you can see all those different things you need to actually think about to assess diastolic function. It's complicated, and a lot of the times it's just it's indeterminate. We can't tell. So I I'm not trying to knock on echo because I spend my life doing this, but I'm trying to say is that these measurements that we take as like, you know, truth are not really truth. They're interpreted by a person who's making a best judgment based upon the information that we have. This is the last um, uh, graphic for showing longitudinal strain. The strain basically looks at the, the, the deformation of the heart as it shortens in the long axis. So basically from the tip of the heart to where the heart, that heart valve is on the left side. And global strain turns out to be a really much more sensitive measure of heart function that probably can be followed better than ejection fraction in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. The heart's an amazing organ. It shortens in this orientation, it squeezes in the short axis orientation, it twists, untwists. So we can measure all those different things in echo, but we use longitudinal strain as the principal way in which we assess function. Normal is less than eight, is, so the other confusing thing about strain is it's a negative number. So more positive is more more abnormal, more negative is more, more normal, very confusing. So minus 20 is normal, but minus 10 is not. Go figure, I didn't make it up. Anyway, 
So there are guidelines that doctors use to figure out, I don't, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over all these, but Dr. Dorbala at the Brigham and Dr. Bork at University of Virginia conven convened a bunch of experts and we got together and said, how do we report these? What are standardized measurements? And this is what this document does. Most doctors, when they're looking at an amyloid patient, should conform to these guidelines. So echo tells you about law of thickness, although I told you it's not perfectly uh, precise. It tells you about diastolic function, it tells you about strain, and it, and it has some other things that we're not gonna talk about today, like there's a granular sparkling appearance, people have described that before, or this part of the heart is thickened. We're not gonna talk about that either. Echo alone is helpful, but is not sufficient to diagnose cardiac amyloidosis alone. Generally, a change in EF of more than 5% is considered significant. A change in wall thickness of more than two millimeters is considered significant. A change in strain in more than two or 3%, I would say 3%, NAC would say 2% significant, and it's really useful for heart pressure change. Moving on to cardiac MRI, and I know I'm going quickly, but I, I don't wanna go too far over. This is an image of the heart by cardiac MRI. You can see beautiful images. This is a picture of the heart from different slices. So if you slice the heart up like a loaf of bread, at the top of the heart you have on the bottom right, and the top left is the, the tip of the heart. Cardiac MRI looks at the space in between cells. That blue there is amyloid. And so the more amyloid there is in, in the cells, because it deposits between cells, it increases the space. And we can use MRI to look at this space increase. And we call that something called LGE or late gadolinium enhancement. And we also can quantify something called the extracellular volume. In other words, how much of the heart is outside cells and how much of the heart is inside cells. And we can infer that if the amount of heart is outside the cells is higher, that's related to amyloid. We also use something called T1, which is a magnetic measurement of the heart. I'm gonna skip over this in the interest of time, just showing that we can look at amyloid in different uh, degrees of um, deposition, and these numbers all change. So cardiac MRI uses magnetic in em energy to um, image the heart. There's also no risk there. Image quality is usually much better than echo. Um, it can characterize the heart muscle tissue and tell you whether it's amyloidosis or not amyloidosis, but a cardiac MRI for the amyloid requires contrast, and that contrast has some concerns in kidney problems. You can't really do it very well in, in some patients with ICDs. You can do it in most pacemakers now. The exams are kind of long. They take about an hour. People have to hold their breaths. It's not so easy to be in an MRI. It can be more expensive, and it's not as widely available as echo. But it tells you about structure. It tells you about function. It tells you about tissue, and it gives you this quantification capacity. So cardiac MRI tells you about ejection fraction. Stroke volume, something that Dr. Grogan mentioned, we report in every cardiac MRI exam. That turns out to be very helpful. Low stroke volume indicates worse heart function. We talked, and then there, we get a readout on something called LGE, which is really present or absent and a pattern. We, talk, we report um, something called native T1 and ECV, and these are those more sensitive magnetic measurements that look at the deposition of amyloid in the heart. And again, doctors can refer back to this document. Again, you can't see it. I can't read it from here anyway. And it tells you what exactly you need to actually report and how to interpret it. Cardiac MRI is really useful to help determine whether someone is amyloid or not amyloid. It's often the first exam that's, that a doctor will reach for. It's pretty accurate, but not perfect. And it even can be used potentially to follow response to therapy. In AL amyloidosis, we're now beginning to use cardiac MRI to follow patients as amyloid goes away. We're determining whether that's necessary and useful in TTR as well. And for the last two or three minutes, I'm gonna talk about nuclear imaging. Many of you have had a PYP scan. This is a picture of a PYP, the planar image, which is like a chest X-ray on the left, and something called spec CT on the right. That, all that white is a patient's heart, and that's, that indicates amyloid deposition. How does it work? Well, PYP is a chemical that binds to um, bone. You should think bone. What's that have to do with amyloid? And it is tagged to a radioactive tracer that basically shows a picture. And so you can see this picture here of, that, of a whole body showing different amounts. The black in the center of that patient's chest on the right is amyloid. We think it binds related to calcium. We actually don't exactly know for sure, but that's really the principle of how PYP works. It's the only imaging agent that can diagnose amyloid without a tissue biopsy. MRI can't do it yet. Echo can't do it at all. And you really have to do that, though, in the context of correct testing to rule out light chain amyloidosis as well. And we can talk about that more in the Q&A. It's widely available. It's simple to perform. And the only problem is that 
a lot of doctors don't do it right. About four years ago, Drs. Grogan, Marr, and Dr. Mass Hanna and I got together at this very meeting and said, wow, we've created a mess. People are misusing this test all over the world. And so we need to actually put out a document that guides people. And we did. And um, those are some of the pictures that I, uh, I showed you already. The test is widely available. It's easy to perform, but not so easy to interpret. Doctors don't get it right a lot, and there's a lot of misdiagnoses, unfortunately, because of not doing it correctly. And it's not inherently quantitative. This is a picture from that paper that we all wrote together talking about the right way to do it. We grade PYP based upon whether there's uptake in the heart, whether you see signal there. Grade three on the right is clearly abnormal. Grade zero means there's no uptake. And everything in between can be kind of equivocal. You have to, the doctor has to perform SPECT CT, that's special imaging additional test to determine whether amyloid is there. The problem is that a number of these tests are equivocal. If when, it's, when it's grade three and there's a lot of uptake, it's easy. And when it's grade zero and there's no uptake, it's also easy. One is amyloid and one is not. But in the middle, it can be challenging. And that's where you need people with expertise to help maybe kind of look at this and help really tease that apart, or you need to do more advanced immune tests like Dr. Wall is going to tell you about that are more specific for amyloid per se. So as I said, one of the pitfalls is that doctors don't actually get that blood testing to rule out AL amyloidosis. Doctors apply the test in the wrong scenario, say someone you know, who's very young and you would you'd not expect to have amyloidosis, and they don't get that spec CT and they misinterpret that chest x-ray image on the, on the left. So in summary, and I'm sorry I went pretty quickly, but I, um, I hope it was okay, um, imaging is really useful, very, very useful, indispensable for cardiac amyloidosis, ATTR uh, ident am identification. It's also useful to a follow-up uh, uh, response to therapy. Echo is the mainstay of therapy. Almost all of you have probably had an echocardiogram and will have more, and that's what we use. We follow strain primarily, we follow EF, maybe not as much, wall thickness, and pressures in the heart. Cardiac MRI is really useful as a one-time test to say amyloid or not, it's useful if you don't have any cardiac amyloidosis to follow the development of disease, just like PYP imaging. But the only test that can really diagnose amyloid without any other testing, except for blood testing, is that PYP scan. And so I hope that was helpful. I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A.